Greetings. My name is Barry Setterfield. Welcome to this presentation. Most of my adult life I've been talking and lecturing and researching about astronomy and stars. This session is about stars. My wife, when she was a young girl, thought that stars were places or holes in the heavens where angels were looking out watching what we were doing. She thought that as a result of this, heaven must be extremely bright. Well, it's an interesting concept. But in this session, we want to talk about what is true and what is false about the star stories. We want to sort out truth from fiction. So let's begin. The stars have been studied for all of known history. What we thought were simply cave drawings were, in some cases, the same pictures involving the same stars that we have today. Here is an example. Is this just a bull or several bulls? No. Look closely at the markings. On the left panel is part of the cave painting. On the right panel is a star map. On the star map are three red arrows. Going from right to left, they point to a cluster of stars known as the Pleiades in Taurus the Bull. The middle arrow points to the V-shaped cluster of stars in Taurus known as the Hyades. The left-hand arrow points to the stars known as the Belt of Orion. On the left panel there are also three red arrows. Again, the right-hand arrow points to a sketch of the Pleiades. The middle arrow points to the V-shaped Hyades, with the bright star Aldebaran being the eye of the bull. The left-hand arrow, again, points to the cluster of stars in the belt of Orion. We find cave art identifying the pictures shown by the stars in areas all around the world and the art shows the same pictures identified with the same constellations. This map shows the locations of very early rock art around the world. To be so widespread implies that the star and constellation names were already known from ancient times. Otherwise the various peoples in diverse lands and languages would not be giving a united testimony. An easy example is the constellation we call Virgo. That means virgin. It was Virgo to the Romans, Bethula to the Hebrews, Parthenos to the Greeks, and Kenya to those in India. Those various names all have the same meaning, virgin. Some of the earliest records we have are from the Sumerian or Akkadian writings on clay tablets or cylinders. In the period 2700 to 2500 BC, the Sumerians recorded the existence of a tablet of the stars of the heavens. In fact, the Sumerian Gudea Cylinder A, shown here, and dating from around 2300 BC, has clear mention of many star groups or signs. Among them are the 12 groups in the path of the sun. Here is the English translation of the name of those 12 groups and today's equivalent. Gu Anar, the steer of heaven, Taurus. Gemini is the great twins. Alul, the crayfish, Cancer. Urgula, the lion, Leo. Absin, the seed furrow, Virgo. Zibbar Anar, the scales, Libra. Gertab, the scorpion. Parbilsag, Sagittarius, the ancient one. Then there's Suhur Masku, the goatfish, Capricorn. And the great one, Aquarius, Kunmez, the tails, Pisces. And Luhungar, the agrarian worker, or Aries. The pictures in the stars are not obvious. For example, here is Leo the lion. In the same way a child must learn that the funny marks on paper are writing that we can read, people have to learn how to read the stars. The true picture of the stars are not detailed bits of art that we often see in our books. Instead they look more like stick figures when we connect the starry dots. When the stars are connected in the correct way, then Leo the lion emerges as shown here. The classical drawings we see today were introduced about the end of the 15th century AD. The left image is an etching that was added at that time to the first printed edition of Ptolemy's Almagest. His description of the stars and their names, without any pictures, was written in 150 AD. This diagram was gratuitously added in 1496. Instead, Ptolemy and Hipparchus, about 300 years earlier, used to refer to the star positions in a way which implied stick figures were employed, 
just like the Chinese example from the North Polar region from 705 AD, shown on the right. The word zodiac comes from the word zoad, which simply means a way, a step or a path. As the Earth travels around the Sun, we get different views of the stars which appear to be behind the Sun at different times of the year. So a common term to describe this effect is to say the Sun is in Pisces, or the Sun is in Capricorn. This simply describes where the Earth is in reference to the Sun. It has nothing to do with the Sun changing its position. Nevertheless, this path of the Sun through the 12 constellations close to the horizon at sunrise or sunset has been recognised throughout history. The nonsense of today's astrological readings uses this as a basis for horoscopes. We're all familiar with horoscopes giving your future by the stars. Astrology erroneously claims that the positions and motions of the sun, moon and planets determine your personality, who you are compatible with and your future. Furthermore, the sign you were born under is actually the furthest away at the time and least able to affect you. All this contrasts sharply with the genuine science of astronomy, which studies the physical characteristics of the universe. As we have seen, the names of the constellations were known several thousand years before Christ. This also holds true for the names of individual stars. As we go back in history, we have found archaeological evidence that many of the old temples and ziggurats were astronomical observatories. From 800 to 600 BC, Babylonian and Chaldean records on clay tablets and seals have been found by archaeologists. In 400 BC, Eudoxus wrote Phenomena and recorded existing star names in groups. Some of these names were noted in the Celestial Atlas of Jamison in 1822. In 130 BC, Hipparchus recorded star names and said that even by then they were of unsearchable antiquity. In 1922, the International Astronomical Union, the IAU, chose which star names were assigned to the brightest stars from the choice of original names in Hebrew, Greek, Roman, Chaldean, Arabic, etc. And then, in 2016, star names and their spellings were completely standardised, so ancient information has been lost. As a result, if we want to find the ancient names and their meanings, we have to dig way back into the ancient languages. This is where the internet today is so valuable. We can access Sumerian, Akkadian and other dictionaries, such as in the right-hand image, with a search engine. However, the question remains, why are the names and the meanings the same in different cultures throughout time? Several thousand years before the study of linguistics found that all of our languages have a common root, the Bible stated that before the Babel catastrophe, all men spoke the same language. The Bible also says something important about the names of the stars. Whereas man named the animals, the Bible is very clear that God named the stars. If this is true, then from the most ancient times, there was something to actually learn from the night sky. Let's take a look at this. But where do we start? The ancient Egyptians knew the zodiac and they had a very strong indication of where to start. We see it in the Sphinx and in the hieroglyphs, the head of the woman and the tail of a lion. In Egyptian zodiacs like the one at Karnak, Sphinx is placed between Virgo and Leo, as shown in the small image to the upper right. With this information then, let us begin our examination of star stories by first considering Virgo in detail. We have seen how the names of this constellation in the various languages all mean virgin. Here are the stars in that constellation connected to form the figure of a virgin. In accord with tradition, she carries her jewel, the brightest star, on her left hand. The names and positions of the individual stars are indicated on the image on the screen. Let us briefly examine their meanings. The brightest star in Virgo is Spica in Latin, which means seed or seed group, like an ear of corn. The Hebrew equivalent is Zerah, which means the same thing. This word Zerah is used in the Bible in Genesis 3.15, where the promise is given of the coming Messiah 
who would be the seed of the woman. The implication has to be virgin since it is a man which has the seed in reproductive terms. Spiker is the current name accepted by the International Astronomical Union, but it had a more ancient name, which was frequently used, namely Azimek. This is a derivative of al and it is also used in the Bible several times. It means branch, and each time it is used as a title for the Messiah. The star Epsilon is called Vindemiatrix, which is Latin for grape-gatherer. However, before and after Roman times, right up to the IAU decision, it was frequently known as al Meridin. Meridin simply means sent one. And in John's Gospel, chapter 5, the Messiah claimed to be the sent one six times. The idea is reinforced by the Chinese designation of this star as Tsai Tsiang, which means the second general, as the one delegated and sent by the first. The star beta is called Zave Java. This is a derivative of the Hebrew Tsebi Yahweh, which means beautiful lord. The Chinese name was Yu Chi Fa, which means the chief maintainer of the law. The star delta was Lu Lim in the ancient Akkadian language. It means king. However, it can also mean stag, as Akkadian and Semitic languages describe form rather than function. So in Hebrew, an outstanding object such as a strong leader, an oak tree or a stag are all described by the same word. The same holds true for the Akkadian as in this case. The star Gamma is called Porima, which is literally woman of prophecy. In actual fact, there were several prophecies about this special woman. This is particularly true in the most ancient reading of Isaiah 7. There the context is a sign in the heights or heavens, as we find in verse 11. Isaiah then states, verse 14, that the virgin will conceive and bear a son, Messiah, and his name will be called Emmanuel, that is, God with us. The Chinese name was Shang Xiang, or High Minister of State. The star Iota bears the name Surma. This is Greek for a woman's skirt, robe, gown or train. Finally, the star Eta. This has the name Zania or Zania, a Hebrew word. The Aya ending is a common Hebrew abbreviation for God. The names of Isaiah, Jeremiah are examples of this. The Aya is from the initial letters Y and H in the Tetragrammaton Yahweh, YHWH, the unpronounceable name of God in the Hebrew Scriptures. The beginning of the name of the star is Zan, which means nourished. So Zaniah means to be nourished by God. The message from the names of these stars may be therefore summarized as follows. The branch, the Messiah, who is the Heavenly Father's Viceroy or Sent One, is none other than the beautiful Jehovah, who is to come as the seed of the Virgin, who is prophesied. The next constellation in the path of the sun is Libra. It was Libra to the Romans and Mosnaim to the Hebrews, and both mean balance or scales. As early as 2300 BC, the Sumerians named it Zibar-Anar, or balance of heaven in their language. This may be regarded as primary, but the Akkadian culture, which came later, had a different name. It was called Tulku, which means altar or sacred mound, where sacrifices were offered for your shortcomings. It was here your actions were weighed as good or bad, and that derived from the idea of a scale or balance. However, by the time of the Greeks, this had changed again to become chelai, or literally, claws. The reason was that the Akkadian became the trading language regionally, and the designation of Libra as an altar was often used as a seal for clay tablets. Such seals were done with an appropriate zodiac figure, marking the sun's position as the contract date. On the left, this Euphratian seal to a contract around 700 BC, shows the circular altar and the scorpion, the next zodiac sign. This shows that the sun's position was between Libra, the altar, and Scorpio. 
The idea of an altar or sacred mound where personal actions were weighed persisted until the time of Aratus, around 300 BC. At that stage, the claws of the scorpion enveloping the altar simply became the constellation of claws, or chelai, to the Greek, as shown on the right. It was actually the Romans who reinstituted the original Sumerian terminology of a balance or scales. Here's how Libra appears with its star names today. The star Beta at the very top of the diagram is Uban Ashimali, literally the northern claw in Arabic. The star at the pivot of the balance is Zubin El Janubi, or southern claw. In each case, Zubin is Arabic and means claw. However, in Sumeria, a similar word, Zuban, actually means to know your measure, your lot, or your portion. This comes from the idea of the scale showing if the object being weighed was deficient or if the price covered it. To the Akkadians, this translated to human actions being weighed at the altar of sacrifice. This is picked up by the Hebrew name for the beta star at the top of the diagram, which was kafar, meaning to cover, or the atonement. Finally, the star iota still bears the Latin name brachium, which means arm, namely the arm of the balance, as the diagram shows. The next star group is Scorpius. This constellation is immersed in the Milky Way, as you can see. Here we alternate with the stick figure, which also shows the shape of the scorpion and the names of the stars. A scorpion is a poisonous insect which can kill with the sting from its tail. The Sumerians call this constellation Gertab, which means scorpion. Akkadians had the same word, which meant Caesar or stinger, or sometimes the place where one bows down. Today, Gertab is the name of one star in the tail, as shown at the bottom centre. The Arabs call this constellation Akrab, which also means scorpion, and is the name of the star at the top right on the claw. The alternate name for Akrab is Graphius, which is from the old Greek word for crab or scorpion, as they thought the two were related. The brightest star in the scorpion is Antares, near the top of the image. You take the word apart, Anti, meaning against, and Aries, meaning the lamb. So Anti-Aries is against the lamb, and becomes the shorter Antares. Its shortened form is sometimes considered to mean rival of Mars, but Antares is almost opposite the zodiac group Aries the ram, which reinforces the primary meaning of against the lamb. In China, Antares was called Tahu, literally the great fire presumably because it is red. In the tail, a star is named Shola, an Arabic word for raised tail. Also in the tail is the bright star Lisath. If we take this word from the more ancient Chaldean language instead of an Arabic derivative, it means perverse one or lawless one. This is a description of the false messiah or antichrist, the one who is against the Lamb of God in 2 Thessalonians 2.8. This story goes on as other star pictures show the star group Ara, the overturned altar, behind the scorpion's tail. In China, the stars of the scorpion's tail were called Xing Kung, meaning holy temple. In the Bible, the book of Daniel chapters 8 and 11 reveal that the false messiah or antichrist overturns the altar in the holy temple and stops the sacrifice as suggested by the star pictures. It is reinforced by similar comments in the book of Revelation, which indicates that this is going to be a future event, not a historical one. Other star groups associated with Scorpius are seen in this image. Here we have the strongman figure of Ophiuchus, representing Messiah. He is shown restraining the serpent, serpens, the red arrows, from reaching the northern crown, yellow arrow. The foot of the strong man is being brought down to crush the scorpion, but the star in the foot is shuf, which is Hebrew for bruised. In Genesis 3.15, we read that the Messiah was to be bruised in the heel while crushing the power of evil. Let us move on to Sagittarius, the archer. This image shows that most of this constellation is immersed in the Milky Way. There are several more stars down below the horizon to the bottom left, which are needed to complete the constellation and its figure. That figure is shown in this alternating image. 
There are several ways of connecting these stars. Currently in Europe and America, it is shown as the teapot. That is quite new. The ancients all referred to it as the archer, or at least as the bow, and the bow was often associated with a centaur. This shows one possible way of connecting the starry dots to make an archer. Indeed, the bow and arrow of Sagittarius are a common theme in Asiatic astronomy. In the Mideast, it was Kurtko to the Chaldeans, Kisheth to the Hebrews, and Cayman to the Persians, all mean bow. In Akkadian, that group of stars in the figure were called Molban, or the stars of the bow. Often the star names there reflect their position in the bow or arrow. Usually Sagittarius is depicted as pointing these weapons at the scorpion, thereby killing him. This agrees with the Aratus poem Diocemia, written around 300 BC, where he speaks of Sagittarius saying, Midst golden stars he stands in splendour now, piercing the scorpion with his bended bow. Here is another interpretation of Sagittarius as the centaur. In Greek myth, a centaur was a despised creature, half man, half horse. In fact, it represented a man on a horse as one complete unit of war. So the Greeks call this constellation Chiron, who was the archetype of all centaurs. In India, it was depicted as a horseman, Akvini. In China, it was Jin Ma, the man horse. Since two personalities were functioning as one, this led to the concept of a centaur being a person with two natures. The Messiah would have two natures, God and man. Indeed, in Sumerian, the name of Sagittarius is Parbil Sag. This means ancient one or gracious one. Cuneiform tablets designate Sagittarius as the strong one or the great lord, also the day spring or the illuminator of the great city. Akkadians call the star Sigma by the name Nunki, meaning Prince of the Earth, before it was given a linguistic shift by the Babylonians. One star cluster is called Terabellum, which is Latin for Earth War. A cuneiform tablet calls this constellation Prince, the Great King of War. Not part of the zodiac, but south of Sagittarius is another centaur, overarching the Southern Cross. The cross is outlined here. The two brightest stars in Centaurus the Centaur, Alpha and Beta, are very obvious to the left of the cross and point to it. Here is a sketch of Centaurus as seen from the south. The Southern Cross is indicated by the red arrow. The brightest star in the Centaur, Alpha Centauri, is shown by the yellow arrow. Here are the names for Centaurus in Sumerian, Akkadian and Hebrew. In Akkadian it is Haba Sir Anu. We can take the individual components of that word to obtain its meaning. Anu is the head god, the god of sky and heaven, the one with the power to judge. Haba means to come or comes or came. Sir means to command or order. Even in English the word Sir is a title of respect one who has the right of command, like the Knights of the Round Table. Centaurus in Hebrew is Beza, which means despised one, as Jameson's Celestial Atlas of 1822 states. Isaiah 53 uses the same word to describe the despised, suffering and crucified Messiah. The conclusion is that the despised centaur, the God-man, is linked with the cross where Messiah's sacrifice occurred. The next constellation in the path of the sun is Capricorn the goat, as shown here. The Akkadians called it Uz, the goat, but this goat is unusual. Earlier than the Akkadians, the Sumerians called it Suher Masku. The Assyrians called it Manachia, while the Chinese called it Moki. All these names mean goatfish, so Capricorn is quite often called the sea goat. As a result, it is often depicted with the goat's head and the body and tail of a fish. The Sumerian representation on clay tablets is shown on the left, while a more modern example is shown on the right. Nearly all the star names that have come down to us 
describe what part of the figure the star is. But two things are clear. A goat was a sacrificial animal, and in, in a number of cultures, the sea represents humanity. So the overall impression is that of a sacrifice for humanity, or a sacrifice that comes from humanity. Interestingly, in ancient Israel, there were two ways a goat was used as a sacrifice. First was the regular blood sacrifice, but second, it was used as the scapegoat or escape goat. Here sins were confessed over it and the goat was released to escape in the wilderness. The Alpha Star in Capricorn, indicated by the yellow arrow, amplifies this. Even though Alpha is a double star, it has only one name, Deneb al -Gedi. In Paleo-Hebrew, the DN root of Deneb indicates judge or deliverer, while the GD root of Gedi indicates the cutting action of a sacrifice. At its most basic then, Deneb el Gadi means the judge who is the sacrifice. Here are two representations of Aquarius, the water carrier. In Sumerian, its name means the Great One. In Hebrew, its name is Delhi, which means water buckets. In all languages, it is associated with water. Sometimes it's depicted as a two-handled water jar, or perhaps a wine jar. The various names around the world reflect these facts. The great man Aquarius is always pouring out water or wine. The stream of water flows down to Pisces Astrinus, the southern fish, which is living in that stream. There are no other names we can be certain of here. Messiah said he would pour out the living water, namely the Holy Spirit, upon his believers. This may be a picture of that. The constellation of Pisces, Latin for fish, or Dagim in Hebrew, meaning fish in plural. Its Sumerian name is called Kunmez, which means the tails. All names for this constellation are sent to its identification as two fish. Star names usually only identify which of the two fish or which of the two cords are joining them. Apart from these, there are no certain ancient star names. One fish is horizontal, one vertical. Interestingly, the bands holding the fish together are tied as shown on this slide. Here, Aries the ram is in the upper left. The ram is breaking the bonds which tie Pisces, the fish, to Cetus, the sea monster, bottom left and centre. In researching the character of this monster, it is apparent that it is always associated with evil. This leads us to consider the star group of Aries in a little more detail. Because it is a faint group, we use a different form of sketch. The Alpha star in Aries is marked by the blue arrow here and is named Hamel, which is Arabic for lamb. In Assyrian, it was Rubu, and in Akkadian, it was Aiku, both meaning prince. The fact that the name can mean both lamb and prince is interesting. In China, the whole group was Pai Yang, which means the white or pure or unblemished sheep. In Sumerian, the star group was Lo Hong Ga, meaning the agrarian worker or shepherd. In Hebrew, it is Taylor, which means lamb. In ancient Akkadian, it was called Ba Zigur. Here, Ba is sacrifice, and Zigur means right making. Put together, it means sacrifice that makes things right. Cuneiform inscriptions call the group Dilka, meaning messenger of light. In Syriac, the star group is Amru, which means a lamb. Here is the constellation of Taurus, which is Latin for bull. The alternating image shows the stick figure of a bull superimposed on the stars of that group. In Sumerian, the constellation was Gu Anar, literally the steer of heaven. In Akkadian, it was the bull of light. In China, it was called Kin Niu, the golden ox. To the Hebrews, it was called Shur, which does mean bull, but it also means to return or come back. Remember, Hebrew nouns describe function, not form, and a bull will return to get you on the second pass if it misses you on the first. The brightest star is called Aldebaran, Arabic, meaning the follower, in the same sense of again returning to follow up. However, the Chinese called it Yu Shi, meaning the ruler, the general, or the governor. 
Beta Tauri, the second brightest star in Taurus, is at the tip of the left horn on this image. Because of this, the Arabs gave the original name a linguistic twist and called it al Natek, which means the butting. Instead, on some old star maps, it appears as the Paleo-Hebrew el Nath. In that language, El is God, authority or judge, and Nath means broken, cut in pieces or poured out. There are two famous star clusters in Taurus, shown here. The V-shaped group at the bottom left is the Hyades, which has the red giant star Aldebaran, very prominent. The Pleiades cluster is in the upper right of this image. The Hindus call the Hyades the temple, while the Chinese call it Chu Wan, meaning many princes. The Pleiades has the Japanese name Subaru, which means united, gathered together, or to govern. The Persian name Suraya has the possible meanings of princess, jewels or gems. The ancient Greeks call them the clusterers. The Bible variously translates the Hebrew word for this group, namely Kayama, as seven stars or Pleiades. Literally from the root of the word it means a cluster of jewels. In the book of Revelation, Jesus holds seven stars in his hand as representatives of the seven churches. The reference to this star group was something people knew. The possible story in Taurus the Bull may be summarised something like this. The broken or poured out Messiah, El Nath, will return or come back, sure, as governor, Yu Shi, with the Church of True Believers, Kayama, who have been gathered together, Subaru, as his jewels, Saraya. The next constellation in the path of the sun is Gemini, which is Latin for the twins. The alternating image here shows the stick figures illustrating this. The ancient Sumerian name from the 3rd millennium BC means the great twins, which we mentioned here at the beginning. There have been other designations of this group, but this is the primary one. It is supported by the Arab name of al Tuaman, twins, and the Hebrew Thormim, brothers or joined together, while in Persian it was Jupatka, two figures. Castor and Pollux are now the accepted names of the two brightest stars. These are the Latin version of the Greek names of Hercules and Apollo, respectively. In Greek mythology, Hercules had to work, suffer and die. Apollo brought peace, ruled the world and lived forever. The constellation of Cancer is the faintest in the zodiac, so we must use a different diagram. Cancer is the crab in Latin. To those in India, Asia Minor, Chaldea, the Arabs, and recently in Hebrew, it was also a crab. In early Egypt, it was Scarabaeus, a beetle. In Old Sumerian, it was Al-Lul, a crayfish. In ancient Hebrew, it was Ash, a moth or butterfly. These creatures all shed their old bodies and get new ones. The brightest star has the Chaldean-derived name Akubini, meaning hiding place. In Hebrew, it was Akbioni, meaning a covering. A similar sounding but different word in Arabic means claws, and that was thought appropriate for the crab. The Chaldean and Hebrew meanings link with a naked eye star cluster, which is prominent, namely the Prisipi group. The word comes from Latin meaning a crib, a manger, a hive, or a fold for protection of either humans or animals. For this reason, the Japanese have a tradition that says the stars of the Prisipi cluster are, quote, the departed souls watching us from heaven. The ancient name for this constellation was Kan Ker in Arabic, which means priest prince. The indication of this combination of names is that a priest prince is the covering, protection or hiding place for the departed souls. Finally, the constellation of Leo the Lion claims our attention. The stick figure is the alternate form shown here. In 2300 BC, the Sumerians call this star group ur gu la meaning lion. The Persians call it Shur. The Turks Artan, the Syrians Ario, the Babylonians Aru, the Hebrews Arii. All mean lion, 
Indeed, the Hebrews applied this sign to the standard of the tribe of Judah. The brightest star in Leo is called Regulus, shown here by the red arrow. It was first given that name by Copernicus around 1500 AD. Prior to that, it was called Rex by the Romans, Basilius by the Greeks, and Sheru in Babylonia, all meaning the king. In India, it was Magha, the mighty, while in Arabia, it was Malachi, or kingly. The name Regulus is related to the Hebrew or Chaldean word for foot. The king would put his foot on the neck of the conquered enemy. And regal, meaning kingly, comes from this word. The second brightest star, the blue arrow, has the name Denebola. There is a more modern but distinctly related word in Arabic which means the tail of the lion, but closer to the original, the Paleo-Hebrew root DN, as in den or dan, means judge. Similarly, the bo or bow means to come, so Denebola is the Paleo-Hebrew, literally meaning the coming judge. The star Gamma in Leo is Algiba. It is often assumed to come from the Arabic al Jabba or forehead, but this is incorrect as the star Eta in Leo is there. Instead, if we go to the older Hebrew, al Jaiba probably derives from El-Gibor, El meaning judge or god, and Gibor meaning mighty man. In the star story, Leo the lion is treading Hydra, the serpent, underfoot, as shown on this star chart. The brightest star in Hydra, shown by the red arrow, is named Alphard, which is literally the accursed one. Images like this from archaeological inscriptions show that the ancient Egyptians and Persians knew the story of the lion as the coming judge, treading the serpent, the accursed one, underfoot. So let's look at the story altogether. The virgin's seed would be the beautiful Jehovah, the branch, the Messiah, prophesied in Jeremiah. There is a war on earth, and we could not pay the price. Only Messiah's payment is enough, the atonement. In the meantime, the war continues, and the lawless one is against the Lamb, the Messiah. With his bow, the Prince of the Earth, the Great One, takes aim at the Evil One. As Messiah, he will come from the people, God as man. He is the judge, and he is also the sacrifice, the only one able to redeem us. As the Great One, he is pouring out his spirit on those who are close to him. He is the greatest fisher of men, breaking the bonds which tie them to the evil monster. He is the sacrificial prince and lamb, the protector and hiding place for those who have died. He is the sacrifice that makes things right. He will return as ruler, as God, authority and judge, after he has been poured out in sacrifice. He thus has two natures, both as God and as man. He has two functions, to suffer and die, and then bring peace forever. He is the priest king, the Lion of Judah, our king and our God. The Bible indicates that people knew this star story. We give three examples. The first of these is Abraham. In Genesis 15, Abraham complains to God that he does not have an heir to inherit his wealth. God has already told him he'll have a multitude of descendants, but that's not what God is saying this time. God tells Abraham to go outside and tell the stars. We often have the same word translated as to count, but the word does not mean that. It means to tell or recount the story. God tells Abraham, so shall your seed be. The word seed is both singular and plural in English, but not in Hebrew. And so Paul reminds the Galatians in his letter to them that God used the singular seed and that it meant the Messiah. We read that Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. Throughout our Bible, our righteousness is in God alone, in Christ Jesus, the Messiah. Thus it is clear that Abraham was reading the story in the stars. His letters clearly show the Apostle Paul also knew the star story. In Romans 10, 
Paul is quite definitive about all people having heard the message. He quotes Psalm 19, which states that the heavens declare the glory of God, and the night sky pours forth knowledge. In Hebrews 1, we read that Christ is the glory of God. The night sky proclaims the knowledge of Him. People have always known. That is why Paul says in Romans chapter 1 that no one has an excuse. There is no one who has ever lived who has not known something about the promised Redeemer, often from the stars themselves, as well as old legends in their various cultures. Believing on the promise that God himself would rescue us is what marks a believer before the advent of Jesus Christ in Israel. And so we read from the patriarch Job, who wrote the earliest completed book of the Bible. And these are his words, I quote, I know that my Redeemer lives, and in the last days he will stand upon the earth. And though my body is destroyed, yet in my flesh I will see God, whom I will see for myself with my own eyes and not another. How my heart longs for this. Even at that early time, Job knew the story too. Because of the perversion of the original purpose of the Zodiac into the nonsense of horoscopes today, many Christians consider the entire idea of any message in the stars to be evil, or at least silly. Perhaps they forget that the writer to the Hebrews begins that letter with these words, God, who at various times and in different ways spoke in time past to the fathers and by the prophets, has in these last days spoken to us by his Son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, through whom he made the world. We know how God's promise of a Redeemer has been fulfilled in Jesus of Nazareth, but there has been a lot more time in man's history before Jesus than after him. And Peter says plainly in his second letter that God is not willing that anyone should perish. Paul says in the beginning of his letter to the Romans, that God's reality and character are evident in creation. The Bible says several times that God personally named the stars. There was a purpose in that. The promise of a Redeemer was not just given to Eve. It was written across the night sky. We are blessed to have the knowledge of Jesus the Messiah and his sacrifice now. We do not need the stars for that now, as we have it recorded in history. But for thousands of years, the stars gave the gospel message. So the stars are not giving information about you and me. The stars were named by God, and they tell his story, the story of him as Redeemer, our Saviour, our hiding place, and as, as our coming King and our Judge. It should not surprise us, therefore, if the first part of this story has been historically fulfilled, and this suggests that the second part of the story may be fulfilled in the near future as well. Thank you for your time.